So today we're going to talk about penetrating neck trauma. And uh, about yeah. five to 10 percent of all trauma are actually uh, resulting in neck injury, and overall mortality is very high. And major vessel injury is fatal in about 65 percent, and this includes pre-hospital deaths. So uh, because of the anatomy of the neck, the operating physician must have an excellent knowledge of the anatomy. Historically speaking, uh, neck injuries uh, have gone through so many different types of management. And pre-World War I, ligation of the major vessels was described in 1522 by Pear. And in 1803, Fleming ligated a lacerated common carotid artery and had a successful outcome at five months. Actually, before World War I, ligation was the procedure of choice, and associated mortality got up to 60%. Of those who survived, there was neurological impairment in 30% of patients. Post-World War II, mandatory exploration of all penetrating neck wounds became the norm. However, uh, Fogelman and Stewart reported from Parkland Hospital that patients who had mandatory exploration did better, and that became the norm at that time. However, 40 to 60 percent rate of negative exploration had to be accepted. Uh, subsequently, modern era, arteriogram slowly began to gain acceptance to select which patients definitely needed surgery. So uh, historically speaking, penetrating knock trauma have gone through so many literature review and so many debates in the literature and has evolved from no treatment prior to effective anesthesia and instrumentation to non-operative management until World War I, to routine exploration, World War II, and now we will talk about today mainly about selective exploration and the adjunctive invasive or non-invasive assessment in modern trauma centers. But before we go into that, we will talk about uh, these objectives. We'll review the ballistics of uh, neck injury, anatomy of the neck, the signs and symptoms of injury, initial evaluation, and the surgical exploration of the neck for trauma exploration management of specific injuries and some current literature re review. So in terms of ballistics, uh, the kinetic energy of the weapon is what determines the impact to the tissue in penetrating neck, neck trauma. So when you look at the formula, kinetic energy is uh, equal to half of the mass and velocity squared, that will help us to understand that the velocity of the weapon has a greater influence than the amount of tissue damage inflicted. So the velocity is what determines the amount of uh, injury. Uh, as we all know, over 95% of penetrating neck wounds are from guns and knives. Only a little bit of the 5% is from motor vehicle, household, and industrial accident. So there are two general categories based on the formula <coughs> I mentioned about in kinetic energy. There's high velocity injuries and there's low velocity injuries. So low velocity injuries are caused by impelling objects such as glass or metal in maybe motor vehicle accident. And uh, knives, mainly are low velocity injuries, and even ice picks can cause things of that nature. While um, low velocity me mechanism generally leads to a straight trajectory. So what you see is what you get. There's usually minimal collateral damage. On the other hand, vi high velocity injuries like handguns, rifles, and shotguns leads to unpredictable trajectory. There could be thermal injury involved. So in these cases, I'm maintaining a high level of suspicion of uh, associated injury of the directory. So um, among the high velocity weapons, most weapons are comparatively low velocity. Um, and in contrast, rifle bullets strike at a uh, velocity approaching 300 feet per pound. So that will cause more damage. Uh, shotguns, on the other hand, are unique because the distance from which it's fired is what determines uh, what happens to the tissues. So long range injuries greater than 20 feet will cause mainly subcutaneous and deep fascia injuries, while close range injuries typically create massive tissue destruction. So this is a diagram depicting this uh, different ballistic methods in um, gunshot wound. So let's move ahead from ballistics to anatomy of the neck. Uh, there is no other part of the body that has such a high density of vital structures, complex anatomy, many organ systems in a relatively small and unprotected anatomic region. So there's the vascular system, the respiratory, the digestive, neurologic, endocrine, musculoskeletal. So one should suspect injury in all the systems when evaluating a neck injury.
So this is a, a surface anatomy of the neck. You can see clearly that um, in this uh, small structure, you can see some landmarks like the thyroid cartilage, the clicoid cartilage, the clavicle. Uh, and beneath all this landmark is a much, much more complex anatomy, which we'll talk about further. And if you want to talk about in complexity, there are many triangles in the neck, the submandibular triangle, the carotid triangle, the muscular triangle, the homohyoid, the supraclavicular triangle. But for simplicity, for anatomy, we usually divide the neck into the anterior and the posterior region. So the anterior triangle is mainly um, anterior to the muscle of the stenocleidomastoid and the posterior triangle is posterior to the stenocleidomastoid. So that's the simplest uh, anatomic defin uh, definition that we can use. So we know about the superficial cervical fascia which includes the platysma and the deep cervical fascia which invests the stenocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle and there's the pretracheal uh, fascia uh, which invests the larynx, trachea, thyroid gland, and pericardium, the prevertebral and the carotid sheet. So these are the important fascia layers that one should be thinking about whenever evaluating a neck injury. For whatever this is what, this uh, anatomy is just to show the famous platysma. Maybe it's better to see it very clearly on an anatomic test book that when we evaluate fascia or uh, neck injuries, we always talk about the platysma. So this is the muscle layer that determines because as you can see very clearly here and as I mentioned about the anterior and posterior triangle, anterior and lateral to the stenocleidomastoid, if an injury does not penetrate this platysma, the likelihood to injure any other structure is very unlikely. And as you go further, as the platysma is taken out, you see clearly the stenocleidomastoid muscle, the posterior triangle and the anterior triangle. And now further down, you're getting up to the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia that covers the thyroid gland and the trachea and related structures. And further down, you now see the vascular structures and the nerves. And having this mental anatomic uh, understanding of the neck will help the operating physician understand what could possibly be injured in the areas that they're exploring. And it goes without saying that there are all uh, structures in, in this uh, small anatomic area, as I mentioned before. And if that did not bring the message, you can see a cross-section of the neck, and you can see multiple structures that are, can possibly injure. This is just one slice uh, and shows us that basically all types of uh, uh, system are involved in this uh, small area. So having uh, said that, so injuries to the platysma and injuries causing the midline usually cause a greater degree of damage. And the stenocleidomastoid muscle is what delineates the posterior and anterior regions of the neck. And most of the vital structures are located in the anterior or lateral regions because the area posterior to the neck is mainly the scaling muscles, uh, muscle bone and non-vital vessels and lymphatics. So apart from the spinal cord itself, there are really no major uh, structures um, posteriorly. So for guideline in management of penetrating neck injuries, I'm sure all of us have seen this diagram multiple times. The neck is divided into zone one, two, and three, and this will be repeated um, most of this lecture and anytime you manage uh, neck injuries because this is what helps us determine what test to do and how to manage the patient. So um, looking at this in a uh, format of a patient. So zone one is from the cricoid process to the clavicle, cricoid process to the clavicle, and then uh, uh, zone two is angle of mandible to the cricoid process, and then zone three is anywhere above the angle of the mandible. So having this very clear delineation is extremely important in evaluating a neck trauma patient. So zone one is the horizontal area between the clavicle, the suprasternal notch, and the clavicle cartilage. So it contains the thoracic outlet vasculature, very important, bronchial cephalic trunk, the subclavian arteries, the vertebral and proximal co common carotid arteries, the lungs, the apex of the lungs is in this area, the inferior tree here, the esophagus, the spinal cord, the thoracic duct, and major cervical nerve trunks. So understanding that these structures can be injured will help one to evaluate further
uh, in um, zone one injuries. And because of this, exposure could possibly require a clavicle resection or median stenotomy in order to be able to obtain proximal and distal control of these uh, thoracic outlet structures. So this is an example of a zone one neck injury uh, with a knife all the way uh, and most likely will affect uh, vasculatures in the thoracic outlet. Zone two, on the other hand, is between the cartilage and the angle of the mandible and contains the common internal and external carotid arteries, the internal and external jugular veins, the hypopharynx, the larynx, the esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, the spinal cord, the trachea, the thyroid, and parathyroids. And importantly, that we need to remember that the cranial nerves 10, 11, and 12, um, and again, the spinal cord are all in this area, and these are the ones that don't get as much uh, injured, but we have to also bear those in mind. Um, the, the concern about the zone two area is that it's not bounded by any bony structures, so it's easily accessed, is the most injured area, and also for operative intervention, there's no need for um, any bony structures to be dissected away. So this is an example of a zone two um, neck injury. And zone three is the area that lies between the angle of the mandible and the base of the skull. It contains the pharynx, the distal internal carotid arteries, the vertebral arteries, the jugular veins, and exposure might necessitate disarticulation of the mandible or resection of the base of the skull. As uh, you saw in the previous diagram, uh, it extends all the way up uh, above the mandible. So to get to those structures is uh, surgically not that easy. So this would be an example of a patient with zone three area um, neck injuries. You can see wounds are above the angle of the mandible. Yeah, there's another injury here. So the angle of the mandible is probably somewhere here. So anatomically, you can see all the uh, structures that can be involved in zone one, zone two, zone three. I already mentioned the essential uh, structures that are all in this area. And thinking about those structures and evaluating them appropriately will help in the management of uh, neck injury patients. So this is just a cadaver display of all the structures that can potentially be injured in the neck. So how do you manage these patients? It's the same thing all the time. Essential principles of advanced trauma left uh, life support. ABCs is always right, um, and then usual resuscitative efforts. So um, very quickly, a definite airway should be secured in um, neck trauma patients, preferably a translaryngeal endotracheal intubation. One of the options to consider very early is an awake intubation with fiber optic bronchoscopy if the expertise is available because this allows it possible not to have to paralyze the patient because once the patient is paralyzed, uh, loss of airway will may resus uh, necessitate cricothyroidotomy and that's the surgical airway of choice. Sometimes when a patient has a, a, um, an open neck wound, one may have to uh, put a, intubate the actual tracheostomy site created by the neck injury. That's something to consider in a life-saving uh, situation. Um, actually, although this, we're talking about penetrating neck traumas, uh, the literature does support that cervical spine injury uh, must be assumed until proven otherwise. Um, so this is an example of uh, uh, bronchoscopic or fiber optic picture showing airway edema and hemorrhage. So as you can imagine, if this patient becomes paralyzed, this severe edema and hemorrhage will make it almost impossible to pass a tube through this airway. So thinking ahead about fiber optic intubation in an awake patient may be a life-saving measure. So because we're talking about the neck, we will quickly review the landmarks for cricothyroidotomy for any of the um, uh, only of us will be in this situation. So, of course, you feel the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage and the cricothyroid membrane is the area where you want to uh, put your um, incision and put the number six in the tracheal tube. So, again, the thyroid cartilage, the cricothyroid membrane, and uh, the cricothyroid the membrane is where you make your incision. So in terms of landmarks, uh, when you feel the Adam's apple, which is the thyroid cartilage, uh, right here, you uh, now beneath that Adam's apple, which is more prominent in men, is where the cricothyroid membrane is. The way I've, I remember it is like it's the soft spot be, beneath the bulge. And the cricothyroid cartilage is right beneath it. 
So again, Adam's apple, beneath it is the soft spot, that's the cricothyroid membrane, and then the cartilage. So uh, one of the uh, questions that gets posed in exams is, uh, where do you make your incision? Is above the cricoid cartilage, which is where the cricothyroid membrane is. Uh, this may not be the best depiction of what I'm going to explain because this is a transverse incision. Um, I and most surgeons that I know prefer to make a vertical incision because in case you are off, you will be able to explore and get your cricothyroid membrane. So uh, you can stabilize the thyroid cartilage once you fill the Adam's apple with your thumb and your forefinger. Uh, vertical incision, as I mentioned, is preferred and push the scalpel. Once you make the incision, push it straight down with the uh, other end of the scalpel and fill it up into the airway and then put in preferably number six uh, endotracheal tube. Uh, this procedure should take definitely less than a minute, to maximum two minutes to get an airway uh, immediately because it's a life-saving procedure. So that's about the airway. Now we go to breathing, the same ATLS algorithm all the time. So we do need to remember that zone one injuries can have concomitant thoracic injuries. So we need to evaluate for pneumothorax, hemothorax, and tension pneumothorax, and pleural space decompression if clinically indicated, even before obtaining a chest X-ray. And the chest X-ray, if the patient is stable enough to have it done, can provide more information. And going to circulation, uh, uh, this is an important point. Bleeding should be controlled by pressure. Uh, do not clamp blindly or probe the wound depths as this may dislodge tamponading clots. Um, again, the absence of visible hemorrhage does not rule out vascular injury. And for uh, all trauma patients, we always get two large ball IVs and um, give crystalloid, but one has to be aware of giving massive resuscitation with ongoing bleeding. And also be careful of placing an IV in an arm unit lateral to a subclavian injury because the swelling may uh, cause uh, some confusion. So this is what is uh, accepted as uh, controlling bleeding in the neck, either by packing on di or direct digital pressure. So then we go over to disability, exposure, and environment. We evaluate the GCS quickly, look for focal neurologic deficit, as we all saw that the spinal cord transverses all zones of the neck and can be injured. Expose all parts of the body, and uh, a patient who is stabbed on the neck is most likely also stabbed in other parts of the body. It could be the back, and this should be done expeditiously. And it's very important to keep the patient warm. And when as, uh, time allows, uh, obtain from the EMS witnesses patient what the mechanism of injury is. Because like I mentioned, depending on the mechanism, it gives an idea of the trajectory, what object was used, how long was the knife, uh, was it a gunshot wound, high energy, low energy. This all helps in thinking ahead about the trajectory of the stab wound. And it's important to also estimate the blood loss as seen, which may explain um, unexplained hypertension and evaluate for any associated thoracic abdominal and extremity injury. So complete uh, head-to-toe evaluation is extremely important. So talking about physical examination, thorough head and neck exam, uh, using palpation and stethoscope, search for thrills and bruises, which can give a clue to vascular injury, complete neural exam, cranial nerve, spinal column as time allows. As we always do, examine the chest, abdomen, and extremities. Um, and be sure to examine the back of the patient quickly. I'm reemphasizing this again because unsuspected stab or gunshot wounds have been missed here. Uh, again, don't blindly explore wound or clam vessel because this may lead to unfortunate catastrophe. In terms of radiographs, uh, chest X-ray, as we mentioned, can be obtained, can help uh, evaluate for clinically silent pneumothorax or pneumothorax that can get worse. Cervical spine film to rule out fractures. It can also give an idea of, uh, with the soft tissue neck films, uh, AP and lateral if possible, this can give an idea of uh, tracking along any of the vital structures in the neck. Um, now, uh, in terms of the other images, that's where the controversy has always been in the literature recently as to whether patients should have arteriograms, CT scans, control studies, which ones are indicated when, should all patients with violation of platysma have mandatory exploration. As I described initially in my um, uh, historical perspective, you can know that uh, at least uh, in the 50s or 40s, they were doing complete mandatory exploration. And all the way until the 90s, the uh, thoughts started changing that it might be possible to observe some patients. Um, 
But before we uh, go into more details about that, um, some of the recent literature and textbooks will direct us to which patients may need um, immediate operative exploration. And those patients, according to Breath and colleagues, um, they think that if there's airway compromise, shock or active bleeding, positive hematomas or extensive subcutaneous emphysema, of course, with in addition to uh, clinical judgment, the uh, physicians who suspect vascular or airway digestive injury. Now, there are other things that are soft findings, dysphagia, voice change, hemoptysis, widened mediastinum. Uh, those are things that the physician can now decide what other diagnostic test needs to be done. So based on their algorithm, if you have any of those hard findings aforementioned, if they are yes, the patient goes to the operating room. If there's no, the patient has soft signs, then uh, there's no soft signs you observe. If it is yes, this is when you make a decision whether the patient should have a computer tomography, computer tomography, angio, uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy, and uh, uh, EGD, as the case may be. If there's injury present or suspected, yes, you go to the operating room. If there is no, you observe. So this seems to be the algorithm a lot of uh, modern trauma centers are following as opposed to violation of platysma operating room immediately. And our own institution here at UCSD, our protocol looks at if there are clear indications for neck explorations, the patient goes to the operating room. If it's a zone one injury, the patient can get CT and of the chest first and then consider esophagoscopy slash esophagram. The combination of the two is the best option in order to get better evaluation of the esophagus. Aortic arch angio, as the case may be based on the trajectory. If any of these are positive, operating room for combined chest and neck approach. And then for zone two injury, you also look at the violation of platysma with presence of symptoms. Then the patient, again, the heart findings, the patient goes to operating room for neck exploration. And intraoperatively, it's wise to consider interop uh, esophagoscopy, tracheal bronchoscopy. Uh, we usually do call our head and neck colleagues to um, assist us in this. And then in zone three injuries, uh, neck CT with contrast for screening, and then one can consider angiography, uh, tracheoscopy, pharyngoesophagoscopy, and any of these are positive, the patient goes to the operating room for uh, neck exploration. Um, consider balloon occlusion, as I, you saw in the anatomy, this area is a very difficult area to assess, and balloon occlusion may help temporize the patient, and also consider embolization by IR. So this is our algorithm. So again, UCSD trauma protocol, indications for immediate neck exploration is shock, enlarging hematoma, active bleeding, subcutaneous emphysema, dysphagia, hoarseness, uh, stridor, obvious trachea, esophageal injuries. Of course, this has to be combined with clinical judgment, um, but if these are resulting in uh, overt clinical symptoms, then the patient may benefit from going to the operating room immediately for exploration. In grouping this in system, to suspect vascular injury, any hemodynamic instability resulting in shock, hematoma, hemorrhage, pulse deficit, you have to look for it to find it. A neurologic deficit, which may be evolving stroke, blue or thrill in the neck, those are the things that should make one to suspect vascular injury. The presence of subcutaneous emphysema, airway obstruction, sucking wound, hemoptysis, dyspnea and strider, hoarseness or dysphonia should make one suspect laryngotracheal injury. And then for uh, pharynx or esophagus, subcutaneous emphysema, hematemesis, dysphagia or, or dinophagia. So thinking about the symptoms and signs and symptoms and looking for them can help one um, look for particular injuries based on what is decided to be done for the patient. Another uh, uh, system that can be injured is the spinal cord. If the patient is complaining of uh, neck pain, actually penetrating neck injuries have, uh, it's one of the most common things that causes the bronze sequel syndrome, which is a hemitransection of the spinal cord that can lead to spastic paralysis below the level of the lesion. Uh, this is ipsilateral, loss of tactile discrimination and vibration when the posterior columns are affected and then contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation. 
Uh, this is the spinothalamic tracts when they're affected. So any of this constellation of symptoms should make one suspect uh, involvement of the spinal cord. The patient may have quadriparesis, weakness and atasia of all four limbs. Spinal shock should be suspected when a patient has unexplained hypotension. However, as we all know, in a hypotensive trauma patient, we have to always assume hemorrhagic shock first. One of the clues of possible spinal shock is when the patient is hypotensive and not tachycardic. In summary, for the initial evaluation, ATLS first is always the thing to do, ABC, adjuncts and secondary survey as needed. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, is a different algorithm. If they had any of the heart signs, they go to the operating room look for any associated injury, think about where the zone of the injury is involved. Are there any signs and symptoms of vascular aerodigestive digestive tract or neural injury? And then the other thing to consider about what you want to do next is what type of team do I have? What type of facility am I working in? Is my team uh, such that I can be comfortable that if I take the patient to the operating room, I'll be able to have a complete exploration? And sometimes head and neck support is necessary. And also, if one is going to do a stenotomy, one may want to have uh, cardiothoracic surgery support at the same time. So based on the type of uh, institution uh, you're working, you can decide whether the patient may have adjunctive tests or OR for exploration. This is for uh, patients that do not have the heart signs requiring immediate operating room. So exploration versus observation. Many experts have adopted a policy of selective uh, exploration. Because of this, there's been decreased number of negative explorations and increased number of positive explorations. May have led to decreased cost of medical care. There's a plethora of uh, literature looking at both sides. I will just summarize at the end literature that focuses on what uh, is um, more recently um, published. So uh, the patients can be observed and they're taken to the operating room with clinical exam changes, only around 2% require subsequent operating room in most studies. So it's very important to prepare preoperatively. The surgeon and staff must be ready for emergent urgent tracheotomy. In a patient with neck injury being intubated by just anesthesia uh, or by, some, by a team that may not be ready to pre perform cricothyroidotomy immediately if needed may not be the safest and as I mentioned initially consider fiber optic awake um, uh, intubation if possible in order not to have to paralyze the patient. Be careful with cleansing the wound. Uh, you can consider betadine paint only because if it is a large wound with large hematoma it's possible to dislodge the hematoma. Think about prepping the vein donor site and think of course prepping your chest because you may have to do possible thoracotomy especially if you have a zone 1 injury. It's uh, also suggested to avoid uh, NG2 placement until airway is secure because there's the concern that placement of an NG tube in a patient um, that is not anesthetized may actually lead for, to dislodging the uh, clots and cause massive hemorrhage. So uh, thinking about those things can actually help to make a difference in, in the outcome for the patient. How about surgical ex exposure? So for operative exposure of zone 1 injuries, it may necessitate supraclavicular incision with removal of the head of the clavicle for uh, appropriate uh, proximal and distal control. A more extensive trapdoor approach that requires a supraclavicular incision and median stenotomy may be required, and this can be extended to anterior lateral incisions. Uh, be careful because in this area is where you have uh, possible injury to vagus and phrenic nerves in these approaches. And exposure of the viral aerodigestive and vascular structures in zone 2 can easily be done with standard vertical neck incision along the anterior border of the stenocleidomastoid muscle. Some people do prefer transvascular incision. That, in some cases, is also acceptable, especially in bilateral neck injuries. Then operative exposure of zone 3 injuries may actually necessitate cephalad extension of, an, uh, of the incision of the, uh, at the anterior border of stenocleidomastoid. One may actually need to disarticulate or partially resect the mandible. And this all makes sense when you think about the anatomy. So this is a, a picture uh, depicting some of the incisions that can be done to explore the different zones. So this is your uh, uh, supraclavicular incision that may be required in order to uh, expose injury, for example, to the subclavian vessels, to the thoracic outlet vessels. This can further be extended into a median stenotomy as need be.
and also if necessary to explore further, one may have to do the official trap door incision that actually exposes the entire chest at the site of injury. Uh, this may be sometimes required to, in order to get adequate control. The standard incision for zone 2 injuries is anterior to the stenocleidomastoid muscle. Uh, that line is shifted a little bit, but it has to be anterior to the stenocleidomastoid muscle. And now the transverse collar incision depends on whether uh, that may be an easier based on the trajectory of the wound. Um, again, this is also preferred sometimes by some um, uh, surgeons if uh, both sides of the zone 2 are injured. In this case, one will have to raise the platysma to uh, get adequate exposure. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Hoyt and Coimbra from my institution wrote a, an excellent uh, uh, article about anatomic exposure for vascular injuries uh, in trauma, and this is a diagram from that article that talks about um, a way to expose the zone uh, two and one injury. So in this case, one can do a median stenotomy if need be in a zone one injury, and that can actually be extended bilaterally as need be, again, anterior to the stenocleidomastoid uh, muscle. And it goes to explain more details about how to expose vessels in the thoracic inlet. Uh, this is just an anatomic depiction of all the structures that one should anticipate and be careful about. As you know, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the, 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 the different anatomy they follow around the arch on the left and straight up on the right, the phrenic nerves, lateral to the pericardium, making incisions if need be on the pericardium longitudinal instead of transverse. Again, this is uh, something that any surgeon that will have to operate on the neck will absolutely have to review constantly. Uh, to be careful of the vascular and nerve structures around the neck and upper mediastinum. So this is again another picture from Dr. Uh, Hoyt and Coimbra's uh, article mentioning of what may be needed to explode uh, vessels in zone uh, 3, which will require subluxation and temporary fixation of the jaw to dislocate the temporal mandibular joint. And that can be held with wire in order to get the a mand mandible away and the temporal area is posed so that one can um, evaluate the vessels in this area. So um, in the way of when we're now in the operating room, we're going to go through each um, uh, system as to what needs to be done. So if there's an airway injury, again, direct laryngoscopy uh, where a laryngeal injury is suspected is highly recommended. Um, mucosal tears, you can just close with absorbable sutures. Uh, you can cover raw surfaces with nasal, buccal, or local mucosal flap. Um, stents is sometimes placed in denuded areas. Um, if you have to perform a tracheotomy, it's better to do that one ring below the injury when high tracheal injury is involved. Uh, use the suprahyoid muscles uh, for primary closure of segmental defect. In terms of vascular injuries, the subclavian and internal jugular veins can be ligated without any adverse effect. In terms of major arteries, like I mentioned, prior to uh, modern era, all of them had to be ligated with unfortunate uh, adverse effects, in, including neurologic outcomes. So in modern uh, trauma centers, we repair most uh, arteries, except the vertebral. The vertebral can be ligated, but that's if you have any indication that the control arrow is intact. As, uh, and, uh, as, as much as uh, if the controller is intact, the patient can still have intact function. Um, partial lacerations can be closed primarily, but do consider vein patches, which may help to prevent uh, subsequent stenosis because closing uh, with primary uh, closure may make the um, lumen of the, of the artery smaller and lead to subsequent stenosis. One thing to consider very um, important is when you say high velocity wound, one should be very careful not to assume that the, what you get is, or what you see is what you get. Again, those ones can cause contusion in surrounding areas and look, lead to thrombogenic uh, complications later on, even after the surgery. So in those cases, it's, it's advisable to actually resect the area and perform a primary anastomosis. This is a pitfall to be careful not to fall into. So this is an example of a vein patch of a carotid artery injury. You can see the area of the injury here, not requiring transection. And this is from trauma uh, website, and you can see the vein patch that um, 
uh, that's used in this case. Again, closing this primarily, of course, with this large defect will not be optimal. So that's again why one has to think about this preoperatively, prepping the legs if need be in order to get a vein, saphenous vein graft if need be. So these are the different forms that can be used, closed primarily, closed with a patch, interposition graft, you can use uh, Gortes PTFE or a vein patch. So this is an example of uh, a carotid injury causing a pseudoaneurysm. When tension is required, vein grams from the saphenous or even the internal juggernaut can be uh, interposed. Now, a place of controversy uh, in the literature is whether uh, you can repair the RA in a patient with uh, deficit or uh, because there's this concern that if you uh, restore flow to a patient with ischemic infarct, it can convert it into a hemorrhagic one. In those cases, some uh, people do advocate to consider ligation. Now, um, the literature does not solidly support one or the other, but this is something to strongly consider, that a patient that already has ischemic infarct, repairing or restoring flow may actually lead to worse outcome due to hemorrhagic conversion. Uh, however, a deterioration in neurologic status after repair does mandate arteriography to study uh, the vessels or, and or re-exploration. One can consider external carotid to internal carotid bypass when there's ir irreparable injury to the internal carotid artery. Uh, most times, one may require a shunt for internal carotid artery injuries. How about pharyngoesophageal injury? Those are best detected by combination of esophagoscopy and esophagram. This combination actually increases sensitivity much higher to nearing 95 to 100%, especially in symptomatic patients. One of the things to consider intraoperatively is to inject air or methylene blue in the mouth. This may aid in localizing injuries. Now, if you do detect an injury, it's very advisable to close in watertight two-layer fashion. Another option is a controlled fistula with a T-tube, or one may have to esterilize uh, non-repairable wounds. Some, uh, um, some of the ways to manage uh, pharyngeal lesions, if it's a small one above the retinoids, one can actually consider just doing MPU and observation for five to seven days. Those do tend to heal, and all patients should be MPO if that is uh, the method chosen. So this is a diagram that depicts uh, the two-layer closure that leads to more watertight closure. And the mucosal layer and the uh, muscular layer must always be closed. One layer is not uh, adequate. And this is a, a diagram that depicts how one can perform esterilization with closure of the distal esophagus and esophagostomy if this is an irreparable injury. So this, uh, that's the summary of how to manage uh, the airway, the vascular, and the esophageal injury. And as I mentioned before, there's a pl plethora of uh, literature in either direction, but these are the basic principles that seem acceptable by most. So what about the outcomes and prognosis? Vascular trauma is present in 25% of uh, penetrating neck injuries. Some people have reported up to 40%, with mortality rates approaching 50% even in some studies. Tronchial bronchial injuries are about around 10%, 20% mortality rate, and even as high as 20% uh, myocor. Uh, the injured cervical esophagus can result in devastating complications. This is one of those that one must have an absolute respect for because missed injury leads to very favorable outcome, uh, increasing up to 17% in patients in whom esophageal injury uh, is missed for more than 12 hours. So one has to be prompt, perform the appropriate test and uh, appropriate treatment. So because of this, um, there's a debate between mandatory neck exploration and selective management. It seems like in modern trauma centers, as I mentioned in the historical perspective, has now favored selective management. I showed you our algorithm. Now, currently, the debate is focusing on whether selective management versus expected management and whether the paradigm has shifted too far. Some centers feel that too many patients are being observed uh, conservatively. And most trauma centers, however, that manage high volume have actually adopted a policy of selective non-operative management. So um, this diagram 
uh, just kind of reviews the large prospective studies of penetrating neck injuries treated by selective conservative management, starting all the way from the 80s. Dr. Campbell and Robs reported on 108 patients in where they observed 82% of their patients, and this led to only 1.2% mortality rate. In 1984, NARAD uh, reported 0% mortality among 77 patients. 62% uh, per of patients, however, did have surgery in that study. And Dr. Dimitriades has published uh, uh, one of the largest studies in this field showing a very impressive 0% um, uh, to 1% mortality where they operated on only 20% and 17% of their patients. And, and, and it markedly reduced 15% to 2.7% with time negative findings. This is significant because when the mandatory exploration was the norm, violation of baptismal operating room exploration, the negative finding rate uh, approached 40 to 60%. So that, that's a significant uh, improvement. Now I'm going to talk about a study which is probably the latest that I, I found uh, just published in 2008 in World Journal of Surgery, which is the one that looked at 303 patients. They observed 87% and only 12% went to surgery and they had zero negative findings. So only the patients that need surgery went for surgery and they found what was needed. So this is a study from um, um, uh, the South Africa in Gotshua Hospital. They see like 11,000 trauma patients every year. So I think that would be a good representation of people that see high volume. And so they prospectively studied their patient but retrospectively reported this data. They looked at all consecutive patients admitted with penetrating knock injuries over a 13 month period. There were a total of 203 patients, 159 with stab injuries and 42 with gunshot wounds. They identified vascular injury in about 13 percent, paraesophageal in 8.9 percent, and upper airway injury in 8. The algorithm, um, they saw only 25 percent required, um, I mean 12 percent rather, required surgical intervention, and a further 8 had uh, therapeutic endovascular procedures. The remaining 77.8 percent were either asymptomatic or they had a negative workup and were managed expectantly. Uh, uh, impressively, they had no clinically relevant uh, missed injury. For their high volume, I think that's uh, pretty good. And they concluded that selective non-operative management of neck injuries based on clinical examination and selective use of adjunctive investigational studies is safe, even in a high volume trauma center. So this is the summary of their results. They had 203 patients, again 159 had gunshot wound and 42 had, uh, uh, rather 159 had stab wound and 42 had gunshot wound. And they showed um, there were 27 vascular injuries, 18 uh, digestive tract injuries, 8 airway injuries for a total of 53. And 14 of those uh, had surgery for the vascular injuries, 7 for digestive tract and 4. So that's an impressive um, uh, decrease in the number of patients that required surgery. So this is their algorithm, pretty much similar to what we talked about, uh, about the algorithm we mentioned, looking for heart signs, and I showed you our algorithm as well. So when any of these uh, signs and symptoms of possible aerodigestive uh, injury exist, the patient will get encephalogram plus minus endoscopy. And if there's any sign of airway injury, the patient gets laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy as need may be. And if there's any concern for vascular injury, the patient will get angiography. One interesting thing that they do use is uh, Foley catheter balloon tamponade. For patients that are actually actively bleeding in, for example, zone one or zone three injuries, they did uh, use Foley catheter balloon tamponade to to temporize the situation so it will allow them to obtain an angiography and possible embolization. So these are the indications for the patients that had angiography. The patients that have pulse deficit, this is an important thing to look for, the brew and or thrill. So even a patient that may not have external signs or symptoms of vascular injury, looking for this subtle sort of findings may help one to be more suspicious. Uh, positive hematoma, moderate to large uh, hematoma. Some of the patients that are required for the catheter balloon tamponade, they got angiography for all of them.
and uh, they, these are the injuries they detected on uh, and, and geography. Injuries to the carotid, common internal, external, branches of external, vertebral, subclavian, and branch of the subclavian. And, and you can see their different numbers. So they got studies for the patients that needed it and detected what injuries that existed. And based on these findings, that's when the patients went to the operating room. And this led to zero negative surgical exploration. Now that's a marked improvement from 40% to 60% negative exploration in the previous era. So for digestive tract, these are the injuries that they found. They again combined the cephalogram and endoscopy and found that uh, the patients who have any of these uh, clinical manifestations of possible digestive tract injury always got a cephalogram and endoscopy and like most literature do support possible combination when indicated of a cephalogram and a cephaloscopy. So another direction I want to take us to that's somewhat uh, coming up also is CT and geography. Should all patients with zone one and zone three injuries have CT and geography? Again, there's a plethora of literature, however, I wanted to focus on what is more recent. So it's getting acceptance recently, and as you saw in our own algorithm, CT and geography is one of the uh, screening tools to go for because it's associated with less operative exploration, less negative explorations, and reduced use of invasive studies like angiography. And you don't need an additional personnel to come in to help because in order to do angiography, personnel has to be called in, especially in the middle of the night. So one can use the CT angio to guide clinical decision making quickly. A few minutes of run through the CT scan, it has led to significant decrease in the number of <laughs> neck explorations and almost virtual elimination of negative neck explorations. I want to share with you one of the recent literatures looking at this. This was actually from um, Bell and colleagues from Oregon Health Centers. They looked at 120 patients uh, from 2000 to 2005 and 65 patients had significant injuries. 33 of the 65 patients eventually underwent surgical exploration. Impressively, of these 33, 27 occurred before the routine use of CT angio in 2003. So in their, their institution started using CT angio routinely in 2003. And before then, they had 42% uh, negative exploration. 33 neck explorations neg yielded negative results. And all of these were performed in patients who did not undergo CT angio when um, four of which were simply superficial bleeding vessels. And when they included CT angio starting from 2003, they found that six patients that received CT angio had clear indication for surgical exploration and had positive findings. And the only missed injury in patients who underwent CT angio was an external jugular vein injury, which was not bleeding at the time of CTA. This is not a life-threatening injury. So with uh, literature of that nature, which is becoming more and more, it's clear that uh, considering CT and geography prior to exploration is uh, the way to go for most uh, modern trauma centers. And this can help have only the patients that absolutely need um, surgery to go for surgery. So with this uh, basic review of, um, of the neck, we can uh, comfortably conclude the part that is not on this slide is the fact that uh, recognizing and respecting the neck, the operating surgeon has to absolutely be um, comfortable with the anatomy uh, because of the multiple structures that in a small area and, and uh, injury can also occur during exploration. No longer should we perform mandatory exploration in all cases. Unstable patients should go to operation immediately. And some symptomatic patients may need investigation before operation, especially if they have a zone one to zone three injury. And as I've shown uh, with recent literature, CT and geography has gained uh, a lot of popularity and has made a, an impact in this field. Uh, zone two stable patients may only need to be observed closely. I showed the data from a high volume center in South Africa where they observed a good amount of their patients and did not have any missed injuries. Uh, vascular injuries are the most life-threatening, and uh, those are the ones uh, that are either obvious or you have to look for other sort of findings, such as pulse deficit, brew, or thrill, in order to diagnose them appropriately. And CT and Joe is a, is a good place to start if the patient is able to have it performed. The one thing one has to be absolutely wary of is a missed esophageal injury because of the 
significant late mortality associated with it. So just maintain a healthy respe respect for any apparent minor neck injuries and pretty much uh, do a careful history and physical exam. Arteriography can also be considered. So thank you for your attention.